of the ocean has been mapped? It's about 25 percent. 25 percent. Uh, at about 100 meter resolution. So. That's um, a huge jump up from where it was 10, 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah, so there's been a big push. Um, there's this effort called Seabed 2030, which we're a, a partner of, and pretty much everyone that's out there ocean mapping is, is by default a partner of that their data is public. Um, and it's it's really just an effort to, to, to put the time and energy and resources towards trying to map our own world's oceans um, with a goal of 2030 initially, see how we do. Um, but a big push is, is just finding data that's already out there that's been done and maybe not found its way into the public archive realm yet. So we have repositories where all this digital mapping data is, is compiled and stored and then people can go see what's been mapped and they can download the data. Um, so that's the big push is let's get all this data that's, that's available in one place um, or, or consolidate as much as possible and publicly accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, before every cruise, basically, we're going to those repositories and we are seeing what's been mapped so far. We're downloading the coverage so we don't duplicate efforts um, and just trying to constantly build on that. Because, uh, yeah, so 75% of the world's oceans are essentially unmapped um, with, with modern technology. So that's what we're trying to change and mm -hmm. get a better picture. Of our of our global oceans, uh, for many reasons, um, for for scientific understanding, for understanding the geology, for being able to safely place infrastructure, for safe navigation of vessels. Um, yeah, just really understanding what's out there on our own planet. Uh, just jumping in real quick, can I think? We're almost at waypoint 1.5, and yeah. this all seems very cemented, yeah. so we might want to... We're wanna, just going to keep going. Yeah, keep moving. There's the a little seven spot right here, though, at the bottom. Mm, yeah, th I don't... We're not going to be able to reach into that. Uh, okay. Thank you, though. Look how still that sediment looks. Yeah. So Derek, you mentioned how you, they are actively working to try to get more mapping sets into public access. Have there been many barriers getting a more proprietary access, access to more proprietary maps and making them public? Uh, yeah, I'd say that's an ongoing challenge. I mean, so, you know, there are surveys that get done because, um, you know, like for instance, sometimes there's mapping done to look for places for like oil and gas development, things like that. So that's sort of a, a company that goes out and spends the money to survey for that. Uh, there's usually a time period at which they're basically gonna use that for commercial purposes. Um, so if they make that publicly available, then it's, you know, that uh, can be a challenge to their business model. So I would say like after a time period, Hopefully that data will get um, voluntarily put into a public realm. Um, so anything that's really funded by NOAA uh, as a government survey is absolutely required to be put into the public realm. So that's you know taxpayer-funded survey work that should be publicly accessible, and that's where it, that's where it um, ends up. It's very strong um, standards for that. Um, and the other thing to be aware of is, I mean, of course, there's there's ocean mapping done for sort of military reconnaissance purposes, and that's typically not finding its way quickly into the public realm. Um, so, you know, it's a challenge uh, on those fronts, but uh, over time, hopefully some of those non-public data sets can be shared and, and made public as, as um, appropriate. Thank you. Is the goal for Seabed 2030 all of the world's oceans or just U.S.? All of the world's oceans. Yeah, this is, this is absolutely an international effort and drive. Um, so there's most countries that are coastal have their own hydrographic offices that uh, are pretty focused on safety of navigation, making nautical charts to navigate with ships. But, um, you know, that's also expanding into the deep sea where, where a lot of the 
the places haven't been mapped yet. So near shore areas tend to be better mapped. And anywhere there's like sort of hazards to running a ship aground. Um, but you get into the deep sea and there's much bigger gaps in mapping. So is that resolution typically at 100 to 50 meters resolution? For which areas? Um, the overall goal for 2030. Yeah, the, I mean, so defining if something's mapped or not is, is kind of an interesting question on its own. Like what's, how fine a scale do you need to map? Um, so I think it's been selected just like basically a hundred meter resolution. So yeah, one one sounding per hundred meters is what's considered mapped. Yeah, this. Um, are you sure okay. we can use those samples? Can yeah. we try to see if any of these are loose? But yeah, maybe sure. that then. Uh, yeah. Or there or could down just be here. some. Yeah. Okay, seem to uh, stop the ship then. Yeah, let's stop it. I'm just worried. I hope they're not flat. Bridge now. Yeah, that that seems loose. Hey, science, are you okay if I uh, stream the tele? I'll Whoa! Stop, poke me in the eye. Ooh. Oh, man. You know, salute. Go ahead, you on. Sorry, Bridge. Did you hear? <sighs> It happens. I don't think that's too yep, big. Yep, it happens sometimes. Yeah, maybe. Uh, auto salute. Don't know why. Uh, we, Did we lose a laser? lost a laser. Yep, we lost a laser. You want to take a look at it with brow? I think you're hooked on the uh, lens hood. Do I want to rack back or do I want to just... I think if you, right you could lift up. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you can rack back now, but you could lift up and then rack back if you want. I think I just want to get, get it out of there. Yeah. Might have to elbow down. I don't know where the elbow is. The only way to stop that before the hydraulics are enabled is to is to kill the power quickly. But it's hard to if you don't have the page up.
Hey Mike, are you okay if we stream the Telestrator instead of the Zeus? So anything you draw on there goes out on the stream? Uh, yeah, I didn't know we could do that. That'd be fine. Yep, yeah. there you go. You're Thanks. live. Back to the rock. Back to rock o'clock. Just a quick demonstration for viewers. The Telestrator that we're talking about is that we can, in the science road, do this. Mm -hmm. That's not something we want to pick up, though. That was just a demo. Uh, yeah, we have our lasers back, so um, thanks, everyone, for your patience. We were just uh, checking something on the vehicle before we continued with the rock sample. And now Hannah will take over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at a few of them. So there's these right here. And then this one, if we can't get these also maybe this one too there's a there's a few but yeah, try it target these first one of them trying to see if they're uh attached attached or yes. not loose or not yeah kohaku that's what we're looking at right now it's alive All right, remind me again, you want to see if these ones are attached? Uh, oh, no. Right uh, behind the wrist. Right, those right two. Here. Those two. Yeah. Sorry. There's a lot of circling going on. Sorry. Attached. Go for zoom. Go on in. Stay with the wrist. Yep. Oh, that might be attached. Oh, that's loose. That's, that's loose, loose, but it's kind of flat. Yeah, yeah. That, that's not ideal. Um, coming out. Yeah. Yeah, let's look, go to um, holding. Do you think this one is too big? It's not flat. Uh, yeah, that one looks big and it looks attached. Okay. Yeah, maybe these are, because I think this one's even attached to that. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't. Yeah, we can probably. We can move on. Move on. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's all right. Pull wide. Happened. Taylor just brought in new um, pencils with erasers, and they're so much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> because before we a had just thing, like a little had, thing sometimes. We just had three that had like no erasers, <laughs> so like it was like really a pain to erase things. <laughs> and now it's so clean. And I don't see any marks left over. And it's so <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> that sounds like the sort of thing you can't do with a tattoo. Yes. <laughs> He did say something about nitpicking earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, s sometimes on ships, small things like that are like really in, uh, instrumental. It's like make you feel, oh yes, because we don't get a lot of new things. Yes, and it. you can't resupply. So yeah, she's been probably been hiding those all like She's yet? like, okay, oh, now we get new things. Oh no, oh rock. no, she has a couple hundred row? just in her pocket. Uh, are we oh. looking? At any for time. more rocks, or are we uh, continuing on? Or we're gonna move on. All right, move on. Okay. Maybe in a couple of waypoints, we'll give her another shot. A wait. Do you want to stream ahead of? Wait. Hopefully, before waypoint two. Or or okay, <laughs> we're gonna look for Hopefully. it before waypoint two. Yeah. Like right before it, because also at waypoint two, it looks like it just keeps going up. So maybe after waypoint two Probably as get well. Started, though. Yeah, you can get started. Okay. Maybe. Bridge nav. We're just gonna keep our eyes open. Looking at look at us being slow already. <laughs> For rocks, yes. yes. 
Can you please track a line bearing three zero? Oh, we're, just, we're flying. At zero point two knots. Yeah, these look all connected. No, sorry, zero three zero. Oh, is that the Caius fat? No. No, that is a bolosomid sponge. Bolosomid. Hannah, for viewers who may not be familiar with uh, how we choose which rocks we sample, can you explain, like, why do we not want flat ones, and what is it that we're looking for? So, if it's flat, it's not going to have a lot of rock in it. It's probably majority of it is going to be the manganese crust. And if it's round, there's more of a, well, round and subangular, there's a higher chance of there being more rock. And also, we can see that on these angular rocks, a lot of them you can see like flow lines, and that can indicate that it could have important minerals in it. But I'm sure Val can give a better explanation than I just did. No, that was great. And those minerals will tell us a lot about that rock, including yeah. I know that you're studying geochronology, so we're yes. trying to figure out how old yes. some of these rocks are. And, and I'm hoping that some of these rocks are from the Cretaceous because this, ki this seamount lines up with the Voyager seamounts, which is like kind of to the southeast of the, this seamount. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm really excited to open open these rocks, even though I'm excited every every time we saw. Y'all, Tori came and she saw the rock for us, and it, did. it was so much fun to watch her <laughs> try try at the rock saw. I felt like my arms were a little bit too short towards the end, so I was like <laughs> on my tiptoes. No, no, I have a, so Kukui went right, and she's like small, and I have a photo of her, and I, I feel so bad, but we were both cracking up laughing, because she was just so, she was so much tinier than, <laughs> and her feet. It was so funny. Look. <laughs> <laughs> She's on tiptoes really it reaching yeah. sometimes. Like. <laughs> but you know what? She tried. You know what she was kind of looking like in that? She was looking like, like the long cat. Yeah? She was the arms <laughs> out and then like. <laughs> it's so funny. What kind of blade are you folks using on that a saw? Diamond. Diamond tip? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's soft and round and it's... And it's got some water? Yes, it uses water it. to help cut through the rock. Yeah. So right now, um, I see a lot of these rocks are cemented together but I see some rocks that look like they're individual. Are we looking at pillow lavas? Or yes. would you say it? Okay. I think some of these, I think the larger ones might be pillow lavas. I don't know. And when we say that, we have some viewers that are sending in some messages talking about how like beautiful the scene is and how exciting it is to just see these like amazing pillow lavas yes. and then I do see we have some viewers that are wondering like what do we mean by pillow lavas and like that name pillow refers to like the shape, the shape yes yeah. it's it's easy to tell what a pillow lava is but this again looks like a mixture between lobate flow and pillow lava but I'm noticing a lot of the pillow lavas that probably aren't cemented or too big to for her to take take back up mm -hmm. here. So for like a lay person, it, that means that this lava flow when it formed was kind of like medium to slow flowing. Is that kind of a way to summarize that? Yes. And then we'll try and point out when we see some other lava flows, including yes. this. But so far, these are just beautiful. We can really see the like pillow shape of that one. It's fantastic. Oh, there's looks like dead sponges. Yeah, dead Walteria sponges. Well, and I think 
Can I get a zoom on this pink coral? I assume ah. it's hemichorallium, but I want to double check. Sure. See, like these rocks Squat. look like they could come off, but I'm too, I don't know. I think it's it's easier to understand like what we're talking about with lava flows when you see an active real lava flow. Yes. So one of the coolest things that I've ever seen was at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and just seeing an active lava flow and how it kind of behaves mm -hmm. and moves. Um, and you can then see a, a terrain like this and sort of understand better how it zoom? formed. That's so cool that you saw one happening in person. That was oh, like mind blowing, a, yeah. A dream. Yes, hemi really Did nothing you, uh, else that kind of looks like that and behaves and it flows in a very unique way. <laughs> Squat associate. Like is this one attached? I was just thinking that might be one to can we try it? So yes, that is Derek. Sorry what? Oh, oh Scott's in the chat. Scott said hi to Derek. Oh hi okay. Scott. Can we can we see if do we have time to see if this is retrievable? Sure. The dark one. The ship. Oh, you think it's paragorgic, Scott? All right. Ridge oh, yeah. nav. All stop, please. One of uh, our or my former shipmates, colleagues, uh, Ashton, uh, works for USGS over at the park. Uh, on Big Island. I know a couple of people have connected with him for yeah. tours, etc. Yeah, so last summer, Scott, who just said hi, on, on shore, Scott, France, and Ashton um, from the Hawaii Volcanoes for the USGS, US Geological okay. Survey. We were all on the same cruise together on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, so okay. Ashton did a lot of interpreting, like, like hand Oh, that's tours. right. I remember when he was out. Yeah. A lot of fun. Ashton also occasionally needs, uh, like when he was out with you guys, uh, somebody to watch his house and his dog while he's gone. <laughs> and I was very tempted, but I was uh, on another vessel. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to be. Wait, which one? Okay. Please. Wallace? one above it was definitely... Oh! Wow. Nice. Yay! Puhaku. Pohaku, sorry. Pohaku. Coming in a little bit. Holding there. And we can uh, yes. lasers lift it up for please. lasers. Coming out a little bit. Uh, there you go. Thank you. 13.8. All right, does it go in the starboard box? Pull wide. Does it go in the starboard box, Sebastian? Um, uh, yes, let's go starboard box A. Can we get port camera off and bio camera on, please? Yeah. And I got Thank sample you, for you, starting now. Mahalo Kanaloa for the gift. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. He said nice rock. I was thinking that I thought you were saying Kanaloa was your dad. No. <laughs> huh? But be. thank you, Kanaloa, too. Yeah. And uh, where are we putting this? Um, Starboard box A, please. Alpha. Sample collected. Sample number 103. Thank you, guys. Box. Going back to dive. So one of the um, cool things for those who are viewing is that something that's been um, implemented. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, nope. just went back to dive early. I didn't realize you were going back in. 
That's all right. Are you I good? I had, had a freeze fail. Ah. But it's acting up again. You're good. Go ahead, Malia. Yeah, so one of the um, things that's been implemented on the um, Ocean Exploration Trust Nautilus is a, a cultural protocol. And so when we said mahalo to Kanaloa, the god of the sea, um, part of our protocol is to ask permission when we send the ROVs down. So every time we do a dive, um, our cultural um, liaison, our leader, um, Mahina Cavalieri, and um, the rest of the team will ask permission through Oli, which is um, Hawaiian chant. And we ask permission of this place. We ask um, the ancestors of this place, the deities, the gods that inhabit these spaces for permission to enter, to access. And then we also um, thank them when the ROV comes up with the samples. Um, we do Oli Mahalo, which is a, a Oli that um, thanks the Akua and the ancestors. So just a really important part as we sample, um, collect um, that deeper understanding that these are um, ancestral, ancestral um, items for Kanaka OEV and um, that reverence that comes with that. So we're hoping this will be a template um, for other exploration and um, academic organizations working in indigenous spaces. All right, so yeah, we can, um, we can keep moving. Um, Fish. If we can do it like 0.3 now that we've gotten the, the rock collected, if, that, if you think that's safe. What do you guys want to do, pilots, for speed? I kind of like the point too. Is you think we're going to be stopping and zooming? And like, yeah, probably. We can do point yeah, two. I like the point two. I'm just, I'm just trying to. You expect some steep walls too, right? Yeah, so, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're currently moving at. Okay. At Thank you. Moment. Yep. I like. There's a line in. I think I have it right in the Ola Mahalo uh, zenith to horizon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it ends we'll with gra the gratitude with love. Okay. Mahalo, Malia. Thank you for that insight and those reminders as we take our first sample for this dive. Um, and I know that we've been having some conversations about uh, how some of our viewers can learn a little bit more about cultural protocol. So do you have any information about maybe videos or anything that might be coming out? Yeah, so um, if you go to Vimeo, um, you can search on there, look for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, there's several videos that you can access um, regarding cultural briefing, um, some, some more information about Papahanao Mokoakea. Um, so Vimeo, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and look for cultural briefing. And you'll be able to kind of get a little bit of like introduction to that. Um, cultural protocols are trainings. And so like for me, it's many years of training. And for many others who do cultural protocol, this is not something you can just learn, you know, overnight or within a month, but it's a, a deep training that you undergo and um, you know for those who are interested there are kumo or um, kumo are like teachers or the source of information that um, you can train under all of them amazing thank you for sharing that and i also wanted to share with our viewers that on the nautilus site um, there's a gallery, um, a YouTube video was put out titled The Shared Voyage of Ocean Exploration, highlighting uh, how relationships have been built with um, Native Hawaiians and just how Ocean Exploration Trust has been weaving Hawaiian culture into these 
exploration specifically in this area and it's an amazing video we all watched it together and now it's up it's on the youtube but if you also want to read a little bit more about the video on the nautiluslive.org website if you just search for Can a we go shared zoom voyage on this fan please on what on this fan the coral fan sorry okay. am i too quiet yeah it was a little quiet okay how about now that's good perfect Yeah, that's strange, strange coloring. Strange rock coloration. Could that be like sponge something? Looks like it right, it doesn't look too bio, the rock. Let's see. You're muted, Hannah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I was saying how I was just thinking out loud of why that coloration might so be shit. there. But now that I think about it, it doesn't look random oh. enough. I don't know. I was thinking maybe when a rock hit the, ma the manganese and rubbed it off, but I don't, I don't know. Okay. I think there's a, is there a shrimp in there? Yeah, there's a Galthae associate. This is a plain, another one of these planar chrysogorgids that we began saw, began at, began seeing last seamount. The one that gave our uh, slurp a bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. right, it just out. didn't want to go. Wanted mm -hmm. to stay put. I assume they're able to extract that in between dives. Yeah. We're, no, we had to take it out at the end of the dive. That's what I meant. Between the last dive and this one? Yes. It's been resolved? Yes, it's been resolved. So, Tori, you were talking about the, um, the shared journey oh, yes. video. Yeah. So that's something that uh, is on YouTube and that you can watch, but there's uh, just an amazing kind of biography or summary on the nautiluslive.org website. Ooh. Can we zoom on this guy? And it features a few of um, Kanako Eevee that are currently sailing with us, including you, Malia. And um, I think everyone should just go check it out and kind of get a little bit more context about how these relationships have been built. Go on in. And that's not something that just happened like right before this expedition. This has been in the this is an anemone, right, Scott? Not a cor this, uh, single pop coral? Yes, anemone. Thank you. Coming out. Right. Continuatory? What you were saying, it's been a long... Yeah, so Malia, you were saying that we hope that this is a model that will be used in the future by other mm -hmm. organizations, any institutions that are hoping to weave in indigenous knowledge and those relationships aren't just created like absolutely yeah. not no <laughs> no you gotta work really hard um prior to your project you know you you reach out for me ideally it's like two years before you begin your project because you need time to build relationships yeah and not just any old relationships but relationships that are built on trust on reciprocity, meaning that it's not extractive, but it benefits the community that you're doing your research in. Um, you build those relationships um, by being present, um, by listening, by understanding that your research is not the end goal, but it should be an equitable process right. that benefits everybody that's involved in these, these kind of um, research projects. So, yeah, that, that building of trust is key and that building of relationship and the conversations that occur and the creation of the guidelines and the expectations, um, that takes time and it doesn't happen overnight. So that's why we really appreciate, and when I say we, I mean um, Papa Hanau Mokuakea um, staff and the Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group um, have been working at this relationship building for at least three years. Yeah. 
And this is a kind of products. These are the kind of um, robust research that can um, result from these kinds of relationships. Definitely. So yeah, check it out. Go check out the um, video um, yeah. on YouTube, notalesslive.org. Um, and uh, expand your awareness of the possibilities. Yeah, one last thing that I want to highlight from that video is um, I love the representation of people that have sailed in the past. Some of some people have sailed multiple times in different roles. Um, and I think that's really important for youth to see um, that there are so many different opportunities that are available to them. And, you know, those internships are out there um, for people to apply to. And yeah, I hope yeah. everyone gives it a watch. Yeah, you know, it's important that people see um, role role models that the, the options that you have like in Hawaii were tourist dominated you know and so there's options for our youth um, to see themselves in roles that are not traditionally roles that Hawaiians or Kanaka or Evie have held and so all the people who come on board the ship are role models for those who are coming after us mm -hmm. to see like this is a potential I could be like Derek and be a navigator mm -hmm. You know, I can be a scientist, I can be a data logger, I can be the education and science communication fellow. So just really important that's, that we uplift our community as we move through these spaces. Yeah, and you know, um, exactly what you said, but uh, it's also you can be a data logger like Kikui, you can be a video engineer like Jaina. You, you know what I mean? It's, uh, you, you can be like uh, somebody who you, you know, can connect with, the, the representation here. Our internships are very competitive, and once we select the four people out of the very large pool that will get to sail, we then have to work on scheduling and which leg they go on. So we're really fortunate that a lot of that lined up really well for this leg. Took me three times applying to Sayepi to get in. And yeah. I had already had previous experience with OAT in high school. So be patient when you do apply. Good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely get far more applicants that we know would be good than we can, we just have room for on any given. Right. It could be up to 100. But don't be discouraged. Any youth out there? Don't and be I'm discouraged. You, we, uh, our criteria are not what you think they are. It's, uh, we don't just go and look at the transcripts and put the people at the highest grade point average out here. It's not what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. One of the criteria in my department, which I don't know if this is unique or not, we all each kind of design our own thing, is I want to give this opportunity to somebody uh, where it will impact the trajectory of their career. That this will be a, a boost or point them in a direction uh, and assist them in the career. So I've had lots of people apply for the internship who, you know, have extensive experience and, you know, they own a production company already and are, you know, very busy in doing this. And it's like, you know, I really appreciate your skills. I'd love to consider you as a contractor. I'm not sure the internship is the right program for you. And we have had people who have moved from intern applicants directly to contracting. Mm. Yeah, I'd say that's true for mapping and navigation as well. Um, we also try to make sure that um, some of the opportunities are available to people that it's really hard to access the ship. Getting out on a cruise is a very important um, experience and resume builder if you're trying to get into the field of oceanography or marine science. And um, you know, some people are positioned well for that, like through the, the place they chose to go to school or they live on the coastline where they have access to labs and ships. Um, others, it's much more difficult to find those opportunities, but they're really equally committed to the marine uh, marine science. The Rita Gorgia, that's so our first one. Definitely Zuzical. try to factor that in and and give access to people to get out here who maybe wouldn't have opportunities otherwise. 
through their graduate programs or? I still can't believe I got the internship. <laughs> but I think yeah, everybody I bring, bring out says Completely. that. Yeah. I feel like, I'm, like sometimes I'm like, there's probably some alternate universe where I'm just doing something completely different. Like oh. Managing a plumbing warehouse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I appreciate uh, Ed and Derek, both of you, for just sharing kind of uh, when people apply for those internships, like what kind of things are considered. And I'll be honest, Jake, like I feel the same way. Um, I found out about the Science Communication Fellowship about like a month before the application was due. And I had like so many moments where I was like, I feel like I don't have enough time. This is like a busy part of the school year for me as a teacher. And I like, you know, had so many moments where I like almost like stopped writing my application or almost like just was like, I don't even know if I'm going to get in this. I don't know if I should send it in. And, you know, I was hoping that I would at least get an interview and I got the interview and it was like such an awesome conversation. But I was also just like so nervous and like I knew I would be but I wanted it like so badly so it was like definitely the scariest interview I've like ever had <laughs> and <laughs> afterwards I was like I honestly don't know how I feel like it went but it was like um I don't know when I found out that I you know I got the fellowship that was a really special moment um and then later I've shared this too especially with you Malia that like I you know it kind of took me a few days before I was like wait a second like which expedition am I going on? Like, where am I going? Mm -hmm. Who am I going to be with? Um, and then when I realized that it would be this expedition and I'd be coming out into Papa Hanao Mokuakea, I like, that made it just so much more special. Um, I'm so grateful that this has been like my first opportunity to come out here. And I encourage everyone, like, even if you're sitting there looking at some of those applications and being like, I don't know if I'm the person they're looking for, just apply anyways and you never know. I think also the most compelling thing is to, to understand like what that experience, what the experience would mean to someone in terms of how it fits their, what they're trying to move towards in their yeah. career. Um, so yeah, you know, it's everyone, it's a fun experience and you're going to get a lot out of it no matter kind of where you're headed, but it is nice to know that it's going to be leveraged to really help that person get to the next level and where they're trying to get to in their career aspirations. You know, one of the goals we have in video engineering is, I mean, we want them to learn core troubleshooting. But a, a big part of the take, well, there's two takeaways. One, you put this on your resume. Whoever's doing the hiring is like, what? I got to talk to this person. So it should get you an interview. Um, the other is, you know, I'm sitting in front of four racks of equipment that are eight and a half feet tall. It's all the technology in the world piled in front of me. And uh, our interns leave this vessel knowing they can learn any piece of technology in the world. They walk in here super intimidated, like, oh my gosh, what makes them think I know how to do this? And they leave here knowing how to run every single piece of this equipment. So it cures them of any fear of technology they have. And I think both of those things help them in their career. But even sharing photos and all that before they come on board, still work, walking into this van for the first time and realize, I'm going to be sitting there running all that stuff. It's like, yep, and you're going to be great at it. Mm. I know I can't uh, speak for Jaina, but she's shared with me just like how different this internship has felt in terms of like what I. Uh, I think like you normally expect out of an internship like she was just so grateful and just so like amazed with how quickly it's like okay you got it we just showed you how to do it go for it like we're here to support you if you need help um but i think that's really important there's so much learning and growing that has happened here even within like our first couple of days um me and carol like watched our first ship to shore interaction with no plans to do the next one and then as soon as the meeting started daniel was like go ahead jump in and we were like no no i remember that <laughs> one you guys rocked it and it was fine <laughs> and of course there was like an audio issue but it was like totally fine they were right there and helped us and you know supported us the whole way but that confidence boost really helps and and it shows in the interactions now like you're doing you just did two this morning mm -hmm. you know like you're just so confident you know what you're talking about you're engaging with the youth so such an important part of the work that's being done here.
Have you done the interaction with your whole school yet? Yeah, that was, what's today? That was on Thursday. Wednesday? It's Friday. It's Friday, yeah. It's it's Aloha Friday. Friday. Several days ago, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, what? Oh. Did you uh, take questions as well, or is it too big? Yeah, so like the, we, the way that it ended up working out was uh, students were in homeroom, and each of the homeroom teachers joined the Google Meet, and I uh, think like right. the seniors were busy doing something else, so like the senior classes weren't on there, and then like they were sending questions in the chat the whole time, um, and me and Mahina did it together, and some students have done at this point like multiple interactions with me, right. so like they've had time to kind of get some questions answered, and like I did interactions with each of my own class periods and explained to them like this is your chance to really talk to me because when we do the whole school interaction we're not going to have a ton of time for like you may not get your question answered um so we did get some questions answered but like definitely so many conversations that will take place once i get back to school um, and i hope that i have students that even if i'm not teaching them right now at least know my face and I've got huge maps outside of my classroom on a bulletin board of Papahanao Mokuakea oh, and like QR codes that they can scan to watch live streams. Like I'm hoping that they've like seen my room and they can come find me and talk mm -hmm. to me, you know, when I get back. So it was good. Hey guys, it didn't occur to me when uh, when we, it was in view, but next time we see one of those long sponges laying down, we want to try to get the lasers on the stock. I di I didn't occur to me until after it was Copy. out of view. Yeah, that's a wise idea. I think I tried to do that last dive, but we never didn't have a chance. Yeah, I just yeah, I was remembering back to discussing that before. Ooh, this is the kind is that of a big cliff. primnoid fan. Cliff wall. I see a smaller primnoid out front. Oh, now I've got teachers from my school sending some messages telling me they had a good time during that oh, that's interaction. Great. Thanks, Ed, for asking that. Some interesting spikes in the USBL there. Yeah. What's that right here on the left? Oh, it's a Walteria sponge. Never mind. I thought it might have been a large hydrozoan again. I think uh, you guys are almost assuredly going to set a record for most interactions in a single leg. Uh, you've had 10 to 15 a day. Yes, we have. And that's something where like, we have meetings with each group of fellows on each leg. And like during the summertime, it was interesting because we'd be asking about how are the interactions going? And like during the summertime, since there's no school in session, yeah. there's not as many. Right. And that's something that I've like completely forgotten about. Like, uh, I don't know, kind of. Wow, look at these. Impressive. It just depends on the time of year that you're out here. But I feel like this Can is. Can we get a zoom in on one of these white um, primnoids? Well, possible primnoids. So there's a nice view in the Atalanta camera feed right now. You can see this oh, wall wow. climbing up. Yeah. Oh, oh that's beautiful. Gone in. This might be a quality site for, let's see. Oh, beautiful purple criminoid. You might want to do eDNA oh, in here. We definitely want to do an eDNA. Just gonna um, a sample. This is a primnoid. Ridge now. Right. Coming out. Full wide. Low push. Also. Also, this cliffside is a lobate flow, and I can tell that not a lot of debris is hitting these corals on this cliffside. It seems pretty cemented. Hmm. I don't know if I've seen a purple crying weight before. That was pretty. Uh, no, I, I don't. I haven't, yeah, I haven't, I haven't, seen haven't one either. Yet. Well, I mean, my viewings of crinoids are fairly limited, but I haven't seen a purple one. <laughs> I can tell you that wasn't a brzinkid. Because <laughs> yeah. of that coloring. Wow. Yeah, look at the Atalanta view right now. It's just amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool cliff. 
so it's sort of this like bulging cliff. Oh wow. And it's just covered in coral bands all over it. Fantastic. <laughs> it's like a joke. Oh out wait, there. I didn't even mean <laughs> sitting next to <laughs> Mike. <laughs> just absorbing all those parts. Right, right. <laughs> And Scott, the uh, fuzz you that you are referring to, we've seen in the past. We believe those are very small barnacles when we zoomed in on them. This cliff is speckled. amazing. This is Kupayanaha. Yeah, Kupayanaha. I said that yesterday while well, I, I said it yesterday when me and Sebastian were helping with the puzzle, <laughs> and everybody was so. Good. Other people from a different watch were, were like, oh, what does that mean? And we were like, oh, it's one of our, it's like our mantra for, yes, uh, yep. for our watch. It means, wow, amazing. This wall almost looks like it's like a, like oh, Mason. Wow. How tall is this? How tall is it? Yeah. Um, it's it's 12, it's or 12 meters, but I don't know how far we've come up. Yeah. Right. But 12, 12 meters, meters so far. Oh, well, now I'm getting, I backed off a little bit, 40 meters altitude. This is amazing. And that's back starboard, half starboard side of the yep. uh, vehicle. Squat. Okay, so how do we take a Niskin on this? Uh, There's a little bit of a flatter area up there to the yeah, right. We're just going to pull up right. until the, the ship stops. Yeah. Or uh, wait until Atlanta stops swinging. Yeah. And then uh, once we're in a safe position, then we can... Seems hang like it's a slightly gentler a slope up ahead. Yeah. yeah, that might be the best spot. Can yeah. we also get, when we get a chance to get a zoom in on these pink fans? Some of them are looking a little different. Mind if I reset your position? <laughs> yeah, you can reset. Okay. Yeah, you can reset. That seems like Atlantis. Maybe. My dad the, said, the end of its ooh. swing. Yeah, settling out. My dad said that he loves the mantra. <laughs> he Kupaya loves hearing us. Uh -huh. mm -hmm, he loves hearing us say it. I'm gonna start working on a gallery later today, and I'm gonna title it Kupaya Naha. Go find pictures of all the things that we've seen on our watch. Kill two birds with one stone. I love that, Tori. I know. Scott Francis was just saying, now didn't I just say a little while ago the safe floor was sparse in terms of society animals? I love being proven wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what a remarkable difference in a short distance travel. Mm -hmm. So, the density that we're seeing here for corals with this clat, uh, this just uh, at first blush, would this qualify as a coral garden? That term? Um, I would qualify it as because Go it's in. not a reef. Because a reef is implicated to have a building um, parameter to it. Um, is that what you're looking for? Yes. Um, yeah, these are still paragorges, I believe. Okay. Right, Scott? Um, but yes, a coral garden is better defined as a collection of high density corals that not are necessarily not um, reef building. Thanks. Yeah. And these appear to be actually hemichoralliums. Were those little pink things on the coral urchins, or? I don't um, know those were them. small anemones. Anemones. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mix of the two, of the paragorgids and the hemichoralliums, and then these big white fans are the primnoids. It's alive. All right, then we're taking our Niskin.
And we're going for six. Yep. Zip six. Six I. Should have triggered. Nothing yet. It's either it's probably rigged around. I don't want to pull the ball off. Yeah. If it didn't trigger by now, it's you want to go with five. Rigged around. Yeah, let's go with five. Is it triggered or no? No, not yet. Okay, we're trying five. Six isn't working. All right, got it. Down a little bit, back in three meters. Nothing. Uh, I'm not seeing. I didn't see any yeah. movement. No. Well, I was just checking to make sure I wasn't looking at a freeze frame, but I am not. See the thruster turning. I see yeah. the background moving. Oh. Well, are none of them triggering? No, so far. Uh oh. Could be a learning moment. Do we change anything about these? Huh? We didn't change anything about how they're triggered, did we? Nope. It's just uh, the way they were rigged, probably. Sorry about blowing out the background, trying to let the pilot see. There's a see. Common, common mistake. You put the, put the hook through the loop instead of around the loop in the ball. That's Nothing. No, nope. yeah. yeah, these should be triggering. Yeah, no. they're not going. Uh -oh. I guess they're all rigged the wrong way, too. Common mistake. And I know it's a common mistake because Nothing. I've done it before as an intern. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, it is what it is. We'll yeah. learn, learn for next time. All right. Try so. This last one. Let's see. Let's see. This is a big ball. I forgot about that. You guys made two of them the same colors. Jeez. Yep. Solve them. All right. I don't think Nothing. I've ever actually seen us pan up to one. <laughs> well, I don't think so. no new right. skins for this dive then. Yep. That's all right. It's all right. It happens. Um, yeah, moving on. I think, yeah, so we're mostly at the top of this. That was an amazing cliff. Um, just north of Waypoint 2 now. So yeah, uh, when you guys are ready, we can just keep moving. Copy that. Well, that's unfortunate. How much do you want to bet that when you come on watch this afternoon, somebody didn't believe our report and has pulled one of the balls off? <laughs> I do a push past the uh, port I've, arm. I've pulled off one of those before. Yeah. They're a pain to put back on, so I won't do it again. You want me to move the ship now? Yep, should be ready. Alrighty. Guess all of our uh, observations here are going to have to be qualitative. Bridge, nav. 
Oh, Drac out. I think. That's what I forget. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say. I think I'm all the way back. I forget to rack back out. Bridge, oh, now. push. Can we please track a line bearing 030 at 0 0.2 knots? Thank you. Are we still on like the side of this cliff? Like, yeah, a little bit. Out? We're not at the on the sheer face of it, but it's kind of like the slope above it. That's gonna. I think. I mean, we're gonna be on a slope for a lot of this dive yeah. um, as we make our way up to this uh, caldera at the peak. So, what's the difference between a caldera and a crater in geological terms? Well, a cr so a crater is. Um, you know, usually created by an impact. A caldera is the collapse of a volcanic pinnacle, usually. Um, so like when uh, like Mount St. Hel Helens erupted, for example, it, it just basically blew its top off. And so there's a, there's a it, it's, it looks like a crater that, that's created by the removal of the erupted material. Um, a crater, I think, typically has to be from an impact, but a resident geologist could maybe add to that. Yeah, so I agree with the caldera, and for the impact crater, I'm trying to think if I've seen any other crater besides an impact, and I don't think I have. And if... The I, moon is cratered, I don't know right? if there would be more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the moon is a whole bunch of craters yeah. because it has no way of um, erasing them, so we have ocean currents and sediments. We have and plate tectonics. Plate tectonics and forests. Subduction. And, so and soil, so we have a lot of ways that um, impact craters are erased on Earth, but the moon just is stable, so it just shows them all. This is one of the things that makes Earth so special. <laughs> she just did a little heart. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the Mar and Mars is the same. There's a lot of uh, craters there, too, because it doesn't have ways of erasing them. Right. I was just about to ask that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> There's a crater, um, Hale Maumau, which was just erupting, um, is over in Kilauea. So Hale Maumau is a pit crater within the much larger Kilauea caldera. Oh, okay. Huh. So, so that, they, yeah. don't, they don't call that a caldera. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are lava. volcanic craters. Uh, wouldn't it be a lava lake then? A lava lake inside a caldera? I don't know. A question for the philosophers. That's a very large caldera over there. It is massive. And it's not erupting anymore. It did on our first, when we first came out to Papahanao Mokoakea that first day. Wait, it started to erupt. I meant to go back and look and see how long. So was it just for the day? No, it, I think it just recently stopped within the last couple of days. Oh, okay. So it lasted for, I think, about two weeks. So I found this at the Park Service. Volcanic crater is a bowl or funnel-shaped depression that usually lies directly above the vent from which volcanic material is ejected. Craters are commonly found at the summit of volcanic edifices, but they may form above satellite flank vents of composite and shield volcanoes. Shield volcano is what? The Hawaiian volcano. Hawaiian are. island, yeah, yeah. I feel like I got, at one point, I made a map of something that looks similar in. I can't remember if I called it a caldera or, or a crater, but uh, I think a geologist was upset and said, hey, you got to use the right terminology. <laughs> so, so I was trying to clarify. So for Zoom? Gorgeous. Nice zoom on Anthomastis. And what looks to be hemichorallium. Um, Scott thinks these large white primnoids are paracalipetrophora, ah, paracalipetrophora species of primnoids. That's a lovely image. 
the diversity of color and organisms. Sebastian, could you share a little bit about how um, or what you're using to help you identify some of the organisms that we come across? Um, yeah, of course. So primarily, I've been learning a lot of these coral IDs from my fellow biologists aboard, Virginia and, and um, Upashna. And uh, they've been passing on, on a lot of little tips on the morphologies of corals and how to tell them apart. Um, however, there's also an online guide by the, um, um, by the, ah, sorry, by um, NOAA Ocean Exploration for their benthic animals that I use when I'm unsure, but it's not super detailed, so it's going based on photos. It's not really a super well detailed, like the specific, what makes them different. So I'm slowly learning the differences between those, and those can be differentiated on like, polyp orientation, number of polyps, number of tentacles and polyps, the colorations, the uh, overall shapes of colonies, etc. There's a large amount of factors that can differentiate species of corals from each other and can make very, the corals that may look similar from a quick view, actually very different species upon closer inspection. And I think we have to give people a lot of grace because they're, you know, to identify something just like instantly and people want to know exactly what it is at that moment, you know, that's, that's sometimes is difficult. So let's be kind and give people grace to be able to identify things. Yeah, definitely. And I appreciate you sharing that resource because I know we have some viewers who are interested in learning some of these identifications too. Um, and I also want to highlight that we have our scientists ashore that are in the chat helping with these identifications. But Mui, I appreciate you bringing that up because sometimes we're like moving a bit fast mm -hmm. <laughs> past these organisms yeah. and without like a close zoom, I imagine that makes it like really difficult. Yeah, to get. sometimes I have to make some generalized um, statements on like more generalized IDs. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of which, can I get a zoom in on that white coral on the right? <laughs> that one's different. One. Yes, please. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, so oftentimes if we're going too fast, I have to make some more generalizations. Say like, there are these pink corals, they're like, they could be um, hemichoralium, they could be paragorgia. But sometimes I have to make the quick call based on this being so zoomed out that I'm like, okay, these are corallids right. or corallidae and because it's a wider so classification for them both. And in your role as a data logger, you're logging like, all the things that we see? Yeah, I'm yeah. logging biology, geology, archaeology, ROV movements, water quality. I'm logging anything of note that happens so, during the dive. A lot of multitasking, it sounds like. Yeah. And taking pictures. <laughs> nice light pink. Can I see a bit of the base, please? Come down. Kind of like a spelling bee where they ask you to use it in a sentence. Can I hear it used in a sentence, please? So yeah, does, this looks like hemichoralium as well, just a lighter more. What is it you're looking for at the base that helps you with ID? Um, for the base, it mainly helps me differentiate to make sure that these are not some tricky bamboo corals. Because ah. bamboo corals have a ex usually have a little bit of an exposed base with little stripes that make them look like bamboo, hence right. their name. Um, and that's an immediately quick and easy way to identify a bamboo coral from other corals. Thanks. So I just did more research about lava lakes and the pit crater at Mount Kilauea, the Kilauea caldera. So the th the thing that's currently active is a lava lake, but the lava lake is in a pit crater. <laughs> so it's just one of the things that can form in a pit crater. And a pit crater in a caldera can form again, can form because of a collapse in the magma chamber because it could be empty. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think the, 
differences in definitions are a caldera is formed from a collapse and a crater from an explosion or impact. Yeah. And very dynamic. Like I grew up on Hawaii Island, so I've been watching Hale Ma'o Ma'o since I was a kid. And it has just changed in diameter and it's just incredible. It's a living, um, dynamic kind of system. Oh, it, it took my breath away when I saw it. And I think we just stood there for probably 40, 40 to 45 minutes just looking at it and looking at the different color gases that were coming out of it. And it was just, it was so beautiful. It was, and I think even in this photo that I'm looking at, there is a, they were explaining how there was a collapse in one of the roads mm -hmm. and it just like, yeah, I, I literally can see it in this photo. And it just like dropped down. Right. You can still see the road from across the way. And it, that was from the 2018 eruption. Yeah, and that actually created a, a kind of a split over where the Jagger Museum was. Mm -hmm. So now it's like inaccessible yeah. because it's just very dangerous. So that whole area along the, the Hale Ma'o Ma'o is just very unstable. Yes. We... We had, spe well, they opened up a longer trail to get to a safer spot. So they, so they opened up and kind of created one with just like cones and stuff. So you mm -hmm. can tell because the other areas are unsafe. So it's a, it's a safer way to view it. Yeah. And that's continual. Mm -hmm. I remember them closing so many parts of the chain of crater roads that kind of like goes through that whole national park there. But... It's a constant, mm -hmm. you know, closing roads, opening cl roads, building new roads. <laughs> it's I can just imagine. constant. It, just, it really just depends on what's going on with the volcano. Right. And that's why it's so important that we have those geoscientists, volcanologists working and monitoring the, the, the caldera. Well, Kilauea, Mount Kilauea. And it actually is very safe. Um, you know, to view this volcano. It's like one of the most amazing places. It's one of my favorite places in the entire world too. But just be able to view from a, a safe area to me is like incredible. There's, I don't know how many other places there are where you can view an active volcano. Not a lot. And that was one thing when I told my parents and my family that I was going to see a, an active volcano, they were like, you're crazy, <laughs> you can die. And I was like, no, this is like really safe. Uh -huh. And I was like, trust me, they wouldn't let us go to this if it wasn't safe. And so, yes, it's really important to know that, yes, you can view this safely, safely from a distance. And I'm sure if there was anything that was going wrong you wouldn't be able to get anywhere near it oh yeah they'd shut down those exactly. roads and the park very quickly my dad just he even just texted me he was like is there is there really a safe place to view this volcano and i'm like yes <laughs> i mean i'd say the chances are never zero that something mm -hmm. is going to happen but that's true anywhere right yeah it's also the nature of that particular volcano yeah it's, it's not, not ex explosive explodes yeah unpredictably yeah, shield volcanoes are much more safer than the composite volcanoes. Oh, absolutely. So, well, um, Scott wanted to expand on the coral ID talk. Um, he said, to accurately identify most corals and sponges that we see requires microscopic and or genetic analysis of structures. But mo the more awesome videos we have like this, the better at identification we get. It takes experience and understanding of what is the key characteristics of these corals. He's, he also says that many of these corals have associates that also can help as um, key IDs for some species. Mm. He's also noting a lot of these dead Walteria sponges all over this part of the reef as well. So that's interesting. So that the associates can help you understand Thank what coral you're looking at. They can help you make a more better ID, but not like a guaranteed ID, but they can help you more evidence towards a better ID. That's pretty cool. That's kind of a holistic way of looking, yeah, understanding those relationships. Yeah, 
when we, when we say associates, we're talking about organisms that um, are basically co-found on top of the coral, right? Yes, um, they also can be called commensals, depending. Um, generally, they're organisms where um, the coral doesn't necessarily gain anything from it, but the organisms that are living on them do gain benefits. Um, they are different from parasites, which actively take from their hosts, and they're different from symbiotic um, beneficial relationships or both benefits. So the corals are just kind of doing their thing while these other animals that live on them generally gain more suitable habitat to feed. Are they what? Are these all dead or are they alive? To me, they look like they're dead or dying. Okay. Just standing up. It's kind of interesting to see dead or dying sponges amidst healthy corals. Mm. So, Sebastian, you miss or you mess or sorry, mention parasites. Um, we've seen some on. I can't remember if those are eel Shrimp. or fish. Yes. Fish. What Shrimp. about corals? What kind of parasites? Um, you can see different parasites and corals. One that popped to mind that we recently saw were um, tinophores that were wiping out some of the oh, yeah. polyps on the areas to make space for themselves on the corals. Um, they use it to kind of spread their tentacles adjacent to the corals into the flow so they can catch prey that are coming by. And that negatively impacts the corals by killing the polyps. Um, another example that I personally have a very soft spot for is Kulamanamana haumea, which is a Hawaiian gold coral which is a species of parazoanthid, which means it's a coral that does not build its own skeleton. It instead steals the skeletons of a host coral wow. and outcompetes the coral on its own skeleton until it con completely controls the entire skeleton. That's a scary movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Have we seen any, what, I feel like I remember us saying we have a sample from this exhibition maybe? Is that coral? Is that true? Um, we do not have Kulamanamana, as we know, but we do have a parazoanthid, as far as we know. Have Some we species. Have we seen any of them? We have not seen Kulamanamana this expedition so far. They're usually a bit more shallower, and so far we haven't exactly made it to that sh depth range quite yet. Um, Scott's giving a lot of examples of different symbioses with corals. Um, let's see. So he's mentioning that there are certain uh, primnoid corals that actually have colonies of worms that live on them, that they'll actually have adapted their morphology to create little overhangs for them in their scler sclerites. And that kind of serve as garages so that these worms can live inside them and benefit from them. Um, I'm not sure if the coral actually gains from that. Um, but it seems that the worms certainly do. Um, there are also parasitic copepods that live inside some coral polyps that look like little anemones, and also parasitic barnacles. That's something else we've also seen on this expedition. Ooh. So we have a school from uh, Spencer Trip Middle School in Maine. And one of their questions is, one of the, what is one of the coolest things you have seen so far? Does anybody want to answer that? I think we could go around the room and answer that, honestly. Hey, did you want to get lasers on this stock on the right? Yes, please. Along the length of it? Yes. Copy. Bridge nav. Good catch, Ed. And the question was, what's the coolest thing we've seen? And so the, far, yeah. do you want the lasers along the length, or is this I'll, way okay? I'll get a width first, and then I'll go the other way. Yeah. All right. There we go. Width about just under ten Eight, centimeters, maybe. Yeah, the less of the angle it appears at, the better, please. The less. So come in parallel to it. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's we'll go for it. Perpendicular. Perpendicular. 
Looks like we're getting uh, air under the transom. I mean, to answer the middle school question for myself, I, we've discovered some really dense places where corals grow along cliffs, and I always find those to be the most dramatic and interesting things from my, from my perspective. So, just these giant, probably very old corals that we've seen in certain areas along these big underwater mountains. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful, and reminder that there's, even the deep ocean is full of life. Do you think that's sufficient, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep. You got it. Yeah, Derek, we've got Moving some on. amazing images from, I can't remember which seamount it was, but it was the one where we saw like those huge corals with like the huge bases. Those are amazing. Um, and I love showing those pictures and our interactions. Yeah, and I just, I, I always want to reinforce, the, I think most of the public's well aware of shallow coral reefs that depend on the sun, but all the corals that we're seeing and have been exploring on these expeditions are filter feeders so they don't rely on sunlight at all they're living in the dark um, it's just really cool and they form these really s super important deep sea habitat structures um, found all over the world's oceans that are just really poorly un understood their mm -hmm. distribution around the world and that's what we're trying to help um, improve our understanding of, uh, through all these types of expeditions nice Malia what's been your favorite thing or the most exciting thing that you've seen? Um, I'm going to pass on that one because there's so much. There's just yeah. so much um, new things like, you know, human eyes have never seen before. And I s sometimes get really overwhelmed by um, everything I'm seeing. And, and um, I just am just grateful to be in this space to be able to see the depths of Kanaloa and all the organisms that make their home there. I think my favorite actually are pohaku. I'm kind of a, a, a geologist, because I love rocks too. Um, but just seeing all the different variety of pohaku and the different type of flow that's going on and comparing that to the terrestrial flows and kind of understanding what that looks like as, as pele, you know, the lava, the magma. So so much so much it's so rich it's so vai vai um that i really don't like have one specific thing that i can highlight that's fair we've seen so many amazing things um i think for me there were like two specific organisms that like my students would learn about during ship to shore interactions so i was like i really hope i get to see them so then i can go home and like show them pictures and be like, guess what I got to see? And the first one was a Chonicops. And we have seen multiple. And I'm so excited still about every Chonicops that we see. <laughs> um, and then the other one, which I was like totally expecting, like maybe we're not going to see one. But it was an ET sponge. And we've also seen a couple of those. And I just think that they're awesome. So what's a Chonicops for those viewers who don't know? It's related to an anglerfish, right, Sebastian? Yes, it is. Do you, do you want me to elaborate on that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so the typical anglerfish that you guys think of when you think of anglerfish are those ones that from are like from Finding Nemo, the light lures. Um, those are pelagic anglerfish. Chonicops is a benthic anglerfish. But what does that mean? <laughs> so um, pelagic <laughs> means that you live in the water column, while benthic means that you live on the sea floor. Um, so Chonicops primarily lives on the seafloor and has adapted its fins to act similar to feet. Um, so it kind of just sits there with a lure, though its lure isn't bioluminescent like these open water anglerfish. It is instead a chemical lure, and it's based on more odor and pheromones to lure its prey. Um, so it sits on the seafloor and waits for its prey to be lured by its pheromones and then eats its prey whole as soon as it jumps by. And the lure is part of its body. Yes. Um, yeah. Aren't there um, types that have like a like an appendage that waves around like a worm as a lure? Yes, and that's more common in shallow water environments where um, light is more prevalent. 
Yeah. Oh, it makes sense because you have to see it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. I think one of the things I love about them is just like their face and the like their mouth. Um, and I also really like watching them swim. But yes, their little fins at the bottom that they use to kind of walk around on the seafloor. I just think they're really cute looking. And they've got this really awesome red color and they're very round. They look derpy to me in the best way. Derpy. <laughs> um, Mike? Yep. What? Well, well, Mike, like your turn. I mean, come on. Sorry, what? Your turn. We're answering a question. What's the coolest thing you've ever seen? Oh. The scene on this expedition. Um. Fish. Fish. Sorry. I, well, yeah, I do like fish. Oh, there's, there is a fish. Um, I like the sharks that we've seen. Um, Not the chrysanthemum on the front of the cogger? Oh, I guess, are we including? Oh, I think we're talking about animals oh, for the okay. most part, I no, think. They just oh. said, what's the coolest thing? Well, is it the coolest <laughs> thing or is it animals? Just coolest thing. Okay, then archaeology oh, fully counts. Well, yeah, then, then for sure the, um, you know, the, the shipwreck dives, the chrysanthemum crest, the likely name of your town on the back. That sort of stuff. So, in case sorry, Derek, you're very, it. very quiet. Okay, that's weird. In case our viewers missed it, we did three dives on World War II uh, aircraft carrier shipwrecks and explored them in great detail. So, are yeah. those on YouTube? Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So there's a there's a highlight video on YouTube, not the Nautilus channel, the Nautilus Live channel. Um, and so yeah, we dived on the USS Yorktown, uh, and then the Japanese aircraft carriers uh, Kaga and Akagi. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we zoom in on these corals in the bottom right? But yes, continue. No, that's all right. Hold on. Guys, these guys sort of blended in with the primnoids and nearly missed them. Is that bamboo? Yep, this is bamboo. So as I was talking about earlier, you can see the black stripes that give it its bamboo name as a defining characteristic of bamboo corals. So this is a bamboo fan. Bamboo fan. Scott saying the genus is keratosis. Oh, keratosis. I'll pronounce it. This is big stock. Are you gonna? Mike, are you going to finish? Oh, I was just saying the uh, the Japanese carriers, Akagi and Akagi. That was all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some videos now on NautilusLive.org and on the YouTube if you missed those dives and you want to learn more about what um, we saw and what we learned. Those are available. Scott says, finally, a live sponge. Mm -hmm. I know. Is it an ET sponge? It might be. Hello. I don't see the two, do need the two Carrot oasis. Okay, that's how you pronounce it. Do we bring any Reese's Pieces? Wait, was that it? What? <laughs> yeah, that's what E.T. likes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, he likes E.T. Yes, Reese's Pieces. Oh, there we go. I like the suspense. Go all the way around the other way. <laughs> Pirouette. I think it is. Maybe. Almost there. Might have to go a little lower. I think not. Oh, I can see a little central channel. I think I think it is. Oh, oh yeah, there's it. A I'm leaning towards yes. Yes. Yep, it's an ET sponge. There you go. All right. Go for a quick zoom. Sure. Just focus check zoom. Willie, well, yeah, I think you're muted. I can kind of hear you and talking. Back out a little bit. Right there, and then coming out for full organism. Oh, full Great shot. Right. Thank Thanks. you. Hmm. I think 
my favorite things, I'm gonna have to do it by biology, geology, and archeology. span But biologically, my favorite thing has been the tinafores. I thought those were the coolest things that I've ever seen. And then geological, my favorite thing that I've seen is the hyocaloclastic flow on one of the unnamed seamounts that we saw. And then... And can you describe to us what does that flow look like? So what I remember it looking like was it almost sand colored grains and mixed in with basalt grains, just like crisscrossing each other. What I really want is a photo of it. I gotta go find it. I don't know how I'm gonna find it, but, and then I'm gonna probably like hang that up somewhere because it was just so beautiful. But and that was hyaloclastite? Uh-huh. And yeah, so that was really awesome. And then archeologically, archeology wise, my favorite was when we were all sitting in the lounge, all the other watches, and we were watching Atalanta view Yorktown for the first yeah. first time. That was a pretty special moment I think I'll have as like a light bulb memory that I'll always remember. Mm -hmm. I'll always remember this whole trip, but for archeology span wise, that, that moment. Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. That was, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. Just so special and like that's a moment specifically that like I will always remember. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like we were watching moon landing, but not the moon landing. But like we were all just like waiting and like cheering, or at least inside I was like, wow, we can't, I can't believe we made it. Yeah. So, because it was a lot of factors had to be correct for us to to view mm -hmm. the Yorktown. So that was really special. Okay, Sebastian, your turn. All right, my favorite is currently a tie. I think mm -hmm. between the possible new species of tinafore that we saw towards our earlier dives that I think I developed a mild obsession with, which was a little bit unhealthy. Um, <laughs> sorry, one second. You said the tinafore? Yeah. Um, the other one was my favorite was the red um, bobtail snipe eel that we saw, because I don't think there's many video documentations of those living in the wild. Oh, also, another one of my favorite parts was Miss Malia and the hula dance. That was also one of my favorite parts. Oh, mahalo. Yeah. That was special. That yeah. was That was really beautiful. special. Mm -hmm. I'll always remember that. Always. But yeah, for those of you that who don't know what a snipe eel is, by the way, functionally it's a um, eel that kind of has like a unique beak-like mouth that kind of looks like if you took like a string a, a string cheese stick and just cut it down the middle, you have it kind of hangs open like that, but as a mouth that actually has kind of like a Velcro feel to it that allows them to kind of hook onto the antenna of shrimp and bring them into their mouths. It's a very unique adaptation fish. Awesome. When I remember uh, us seeing it, it was like upside down. Yes. In the water column. That is a sometimes a common adaptation for some fishes in the water column is to hang upside down. It makes them more difficult to see vertically than they are horizontally. It's a it's a thing, especially in areas where there is just a, a slight amount of light coming up from the sea floor from the surface. Can we also get a zoom in on one of these red corals, please? Derek, I think you are next. Oh, Derek I already, already went. went. Oh, who? But I should add that um, we saw, we've, been, we've been seeing oceanic white tip sharks yeah. at the surface, like just chasing schools of fish around the ship, and um, birds have been, these terns have been feeding All right, on the ship. Thank you. The, the sharks scare up, so it's kind of a, you can just kind of go out on deck and watch this all unfold. It's really cool. Yeah. 
I think I saw you out there yesterday, Derek, looking, because when all those birds were out, that was incredible. It's just amazing. Like, yeah. you're just looking over the edge of the ship, and there's sharks right below you <laughs> patrolling around. It's really... Yeah, that was amazing. And we were wondering if they're following us, because there were three, like, a couple of days ago, right? And yeah. then there's been three, like, during this time. But, so, interesting. Nice. I'm glad you brought them up, Derek, because those have also been one of my favorite parts. Yeah, so so amazing to see Many you in the wild. Oh wow, this wow. this primnoid has a ton of um, brittle star associates. I know we aren't finished going around, but we have a really good question for you, Sebastian, about associates. Um, and someone was wondering if the corals benefit from the associates by like the waste that's maybe produced. Like, is that something that the corals can feed on? Um, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Um, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Um, a lot of these corals rely on marine snow coming through the water column. And a lot of these marine snows has probably been like thrice processed, processed by other organisms in the water column. So sometimes they're more adapted to specifically these more finely mm -hmm. processed um, organic materials, but some corals can benefit from the excretions of their associates and feed off of that. But I'm not sure if it's to a degree that would sustain it alone. Yeah, and we're talking about marine snow where you're mentioning like the white specks that we see kind of floating around sometimes. Yes, that's correct. And also, I think I see a big orange black coral to the left. When we just lifted it off out. the bottom there, I think a squat lobster leapt off of the porch. Yes, I just saw it in the still cam. I think you missed it, Mike. But it was, it was moving fast. Nice. Thanks, Sebastian, for that of course. explanation. Jake, do you have a cool moment or something that we've seen that's special for you? Um, the salute. Yeah, that was special. Um, well, I had never seen a, uh, a wreck dive in that first, just that first, the first 10 minutes coming down on Yorktown was pretty, I thought it was pretty amazing. Yeah. I was very surprised at the quality of the footage that we had and I wasn't even my watch. I just stayed up here. But, uh, yeah, I think we were all very pleasantly surprised at how well yeah. Atalanta was able to film the wrecks on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Tito, what about you? Do you have something you'd like to share? I'm going to go all broken record with Yorktown, uh, piloting Atalanta around there, uh, two meters away, three meters <laughs> away, being able to zoom in on the inside of the, the superstructure and such. And that seemed the, the best preserved and least amount of sediment on top of and such, but that was definitely my most what exciting moment of the cruise. Yeah. Like you're peering back in time. Yeah, I feel like all of us have so many different things to choose from. So these are like one of, I don't even know how many special moments that we all probably have. Ed, what about you? Um, I, you know, of course I love the shipwrecks. I wish we were there with a, you know, uh, superb ROV with a great imager and all that. So I, I want to go back and get those again. Um, I, I really enjoyed the kind of, uh, geology work we've been doing on this leg that's, you know, not just our pure exploration, but is really focused on informing one specific, you know, theory. Um, and that's been really cool. And then topside, the time and space that's been allocated for cultural protocol, it's really been nice to see that grow over the last 10 or 15 years and hopefully continue to do so. Yeah, I know uh, we mentioned the hula earlier as a moment that a lot of us are not going to, 
you know, forget when we look back, I know that's something that I'm always going to remember. Um, but I know we maybe have some viewers that don't know what we're talking about and don't know why that was a special protocol. Malia, would you be able to share a little bit about Yeah, so the hula that uh, was done as cult cultural protocol um, as we were finishing up those dives on the aircraft carriers. Yeah, so that was um, such a special moment. Um, and it was a collaborative effort with the four um, Kanaka OEV women on board, so Native Hawaiian women, um, indigenous to Hawaii. And we choreographed a hula to a song, um, uh, actually an Okinawan song called Umi no Koi. And the intention of the hula was to bring cultural practice into a indigenous space of Papahana Mokuakea and to use that practice to bridge two different nations that at one time were mortal enemies. And the intention was to bring it this tr traumatic events that occurred during the Battle of Midway and to create a space for healing and um, for remembrance, for reverence, um, for aloha, really aloha to, to help to heal those wounds and to honor the over 3,000 um, sailors and um, airmen from Japan and from America in a very um, Hawaiian way and I think it was just so emotional we did it on the last um, day of the dives after we had um, you know surveyed the three um, uh, vessels and it was a heavy moments that we all experienced you know along with all of the viewers and it was just a way to to really bring healing and to bring um aloha into this space where there wasn't aloha before and um it was incredible i think there was a lot of um, emotions and tears and um, healing that occurred through that um, expression of hula and I just felt so um, honored to be able, I actually had a, a, an ula leo, so like a voice tell me before I even got on board the ship. And when I found out I was coming on board this expedition, it was at night that I was woken up in a dream and this dream told me that we needed to dance hula. And it said, you need to dance hula for um, the sailors. And I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> I don't know what that's going to look like. <laughs> but, you know, following those ancestral voices, which I believe, you know, through dreams is how our ancestors um, communicate with, with me. Just, you know, I can only speak on behalf of myself. But I had to follow that. Because if I didn't, I didn't want to know what the consequences were for my not following that. <laughs> yeah. And so I did. So I asked the other women, um, who were on board if they would join me in honoring um, the space and the place and the people and that hula was a culmination of all of that yeah it was powerful it was so special and um i know that uh we were that was like during our four to eight watch so i know our front row did not get to go outside and witness it um, we, we actually watched. We watched? spun one of the deck cameras around. We're watching on that monitor up oh, there. Okay. Good. Um, did y'all start choreographing that before the expedition started, or was that all done? I did. I yeah. started choreographing before, and then um, I did two verses. And then when we came on board the ship, um, then the the rest of um, the uh, Mahina, Jaina, and Kukui. Then we worked on the rest of the verses together, which was very challenging because on a moving ship, <laughs> it's not quite easy to dance, yeah. you know, but we were so blessed that day 
because it was just beautiful. The ocean was calm. It was malie. Um, everything just aligned perfectly to be able to do that in the space that we had. Thank you for the measurement, by the way. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I believe even after watching the animation video of the shark, and then also knowing that that shark showed up, it like, showed up soon right after. after yeah, I was. Yep. It kind of when I was watching the animation, I was just like, "This is, this is crazy." Like Kupa and Naha, how yeah. like that all worked worked out. Yeah, it's kind of a confirmation. So Ho'ailona is a word that we use in Hawaii when we have those environmental factors that confirm that what you're doing is good. And so that mano, that shark showing up after we did the hula, was a great confirmation for us that, good job, you guys listened. <laughs> See, your dream was right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> wow. And for viewers who are maybe wondering what uh, video we're talking about, it was titled Mano. And do we know if there's any way that that's available for public I, taxes? I believe it's right now in many of the film festivals. Okay. Um, it's going around to different film festivals, so I don't think it's publicly available. Mm -hmm. um, but look out for it. It is an amazing yeah. animation, uh, a, a beautiful historical account of the relationship Kanako o Ivi uh, maintain to Mano or sharks. And oh, it is just a beautiful film yeah. that we encourage you all to watch when you get an opportunity and it's publicly available. Yeah, that was really moving. But I usually get emotional with like all anything that has to do with like sea stuff or <laughs> anything. So I was I was tearing up a little bit. I was like, this is uh, yeah, this is a lot. It was beautiful and then like bitter bittersweet at mm -hmm. some parts. Yeah, I won't yeah. spoil it. <laughs> That pumice there? Oh, yeah. Well, actually, I, no, I think that's sponge. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, a sponge. Uh, also, we did pass low bait flow. Oh, right here. Here's some <laughs> low bait flow. And then I can't tell if these are cemented together, but I think it's, a, again, a mixture between low bait flow and then pillow lavas. I think that's a, no, never mind. That's not a seat pen right there. Um, but yeah, there's so many dead sponges here of just all varieties. How much does a coral oh, need to- Big sea star. How much does a coral need to survive compared to a sponge? Um, sorry, repeat that question? So if the corals are doing great, and the sponges are dying, is there a difference in the amount of nutrients they need to survive, or do they need the same amount? Um, they do take the same food sources. Um, it's more of a competitive in ter so terms of space, but they do occupy different spaces and in different ways. Let's go all the way in real quick, mm -hmm. and then get you the whole organism. I'm just trying to There's think why focus. the corals are doing so much better than this one. I'm more leaning less towards food competition yep. and Users. more towards water parameter conditions. Okay. What uh, water parameters might change that would kill them? It's in the top left. Temperature, um, uh, changes like in bamboo, oxygen, uh, changes in pH. Um, yeah, but do you think so any of those happen down here? Is that just a single? It could. Um, I'm not well-versed enough in that particular area of the field to no make a definitive yes. answer. Do you need that at but all? It's pretty possible. I'm sorry? Do you need this at all? Um, this coral? No. Yeah. Okay, I'd, be, great, I'd be surprised if any of those parameters changed drastically. Well, It's also possible that there is disease, but what I'm noticing is that there's a general trend of dying sponges across most of the seamounts that we've been going across so far. So I'm wondering if it's a broader geographical issue. I'm also, so these changes don't affect corals as much as sponges? Um, they can and cannot depending. It's hard to 
define it. Okay. Um, it's a lot of, it would be a lot of, um, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Debates and assumptions when we don't have the data. Okay. Conjecture. Conjecture, yes, thank you. That was really looking for. Also, I think it's worth noting that the environmental parameters that a lot of these species uh, we're just kind of building that knowledge now. Like there's there's a, there's a lot more we need to understand about their basic like biology. Oh. Uh, and unfortunately, we're already we're starting that process midway through the anthropogenic climate crisis. So often or not, we're taking a baseline while as it happens. We are not necessarily knowing if this is truly the baseline habitat or not. Um, this could be already an effect of climate change for all we know, and we're just observing it now and not knowing what the community looked like prior. Yeah. That's why it's good to go to get, when we go to different areas with different types of water characteristics and see corals or sponges doing well or poorly or just where they can hit, what they can tolerate, that, that's sort of a surrogate for like maybe future conditions or past conditions, so it's, it helps it all helps, just having that variety of places we go to. Um, Scott has put his input. He's saying, I suspect that these sponges are very old. Parentheses, I mean that they could be growing here a very long time ago. Once they die, the, skeleton, the silica skeleton just sits at the bottom for a long time and doesn't get buried by the sediment because sedimentation is so slow. And these aren't apparently bacteria and fungi decomposing the, the silica skeleton. So we may be seeing sponges from long ago that may have died, may not have died recently. So that is a possibility as well. It makes you wonder how old they are. Mm -hmm. Is there any oh. way to date things like that? Like this, the skeleton of a sponge? Is I'm sure there is. I've read some techniques about like literally kind of like incinerating the silica and the spicules and then getting a carbon date from that. But I'm not sure how accurate it is. I'm not sure if Scott knows more about that. This is more of a Chris Kelly question. picturing Chris Kelly incinerating sponges in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he does most of his work nowadays. And Scott's just saying, just to be clear, he's not saying the sponges are old. He's saying that the skeletons of dead sponges could be sitting here on the sea for a very long time. Oh, and I think we're re-entering a high-density yeah. coral area. A lot of stuff going on, yeah. Bridge nav. All stop, please. Thank you. So we're a few minutes away from a watch change, just yeah, to let our viewers sense. know. Yeah. We made it to waypoint three. Nice. Pretty, I think that's a success. Pretty good progress we made, yeah. So after we did the 50 meter contour mapping, what do we have, like 75 waypoints now? <laughs> no, I, I threw some like interim waypoints. Um, okay. Yeah, it's still, I think, 9. Still 11? Or 11. Was it 11 or 9? I think it was 11. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 10 up to the, uh, the lip of the caldera, and then one more inside. Uh, I see 13 on my dive plan. Oh. Really? Yeah. What? <laughs> Wait. No, that was last dive plan. Oh, someone left this in front on my desk. That's an old one. Yeah, most of these work surfaces have dive plan archaeology going on. There's just strata of dive plans laying around. Yep, okay. Here's the right one. So we've stopped moving the ship and 
probably be visualizing this for a few minutes, and including during the watch change. I see we've got a really interesting question from a viewer that we maybe don't have an answer for right now, but someone's wondering like if we've ever come across a sponge or coral that has died and we found the skeleton of it, and if that could be like an extinct coral or sponge that we haven't seen living before. Um, I think that's largely unlikely in terms of like ancient species of corals. I think erosional pressures will have either eroded them down or buried them at this depth, mm -hmm. or even encrusted them with manganese. Um, but if we have seen coral, coral skeletons, but they're probably a lot more younger and more representative of the corals we see now. I wonder if the have you ever part of the question means since OET started exploring the world's oceans. I mean, that's global so and we don't we, I don't think we would know we don't collect skeletons and determine what the uh, originator was so it's a hard question to answer mm -hmm. is it possible maybe uh, I don't firsthand have any information about it watch change happening watch change what up Four to eight watch, most of us are about to head out. This is an amazing cliff that we're looking at together right now, and the rest Here's of this dive is going to be really exciting. Watch change the video. Uh, no, but that's okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I can see. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> 